Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to the latest video of narrations from Reddit. In the first story, testing humans for arcane ability might have caused problems for the rest of the universe. And in story number two, a human and a lizard go to an ice planet where an accident forces them to improvise to save lives. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. We may have fucked up, written by Simone Angela. My name is Erica. I am a scientist in service of the Galactic Union Exploratory Fleet, and today marks the beginning of lab tests in the first contact protocol procedure that has been in effect ever since we stumbled on these jumped up primates. The humans are pretty standard race. Two legs, two arms, one head and five or six senses. Forward-facing eyes, olfactory organ in the middle of their face, and a standard abnormal mouth complemented the image of an absolutely average-looking species, lacking enough sexual dimorphism to be of true note beyond obviously secondary sexual characteristics. The tests were designed to push the newly contacted species' limits to ascertain the risks of annexing or simply the compatibility with the rest of the Galactic Union. After all, the species whose mind can be shattered by the barest psychic touch is ill-adjusted for modern society. The tests are conducted by a big gym-like room to avoid excessive stress induced by being alone with a full room of aliens studying you to skew the results. But it seems that we might have underestimated the sheer sociality of the humans. The endurance tests were performed at the same time and this apparently sparked an impromptu competition between the subjects. The results were astonishing. The less physically fit subjects lasted pretty long, reaching five minutes of sustained run at a sedate pace, roughly an average for non-professional athletes of most species. While other more fit subjects lasted upwards of ten minutes, with the best lasting an incredible one hour and fifty minutes. Granted, the subject's history suggested that her morning routine lasted 45 minutes, so the result was not entirely unexpected. But this result certainly raised our expectations for the humans in the physical department. It was pretty clear that they had absolutely no talent in the arcade, as every ounce of potential was poured into the physical body. It also was an almost predictable result, as the entire sector around the humans was devoid of any arcade energy. So, we were expecting some strange quirk of evolution due to the environment, and nothing this extreme. The rest of the physical tests were conducted in a similar atmosphere as the first, the awe at seeing records casually shattered, not a thing easily concealed. The true problem sprung up when we began testing for arcane talent. It was obvious for us that what the results would be, but protocol was protocol and they were the last test for a reason. The arcane was a parallel dimension overlapping our own, filled to the brim with unstable arcane energy that was harnessed by a talented few to shape reality and bend physics. Now, to understand the insanity that went down that day, I have to clarify something. The arcane, or psychic, energy, as it is called by some, is an intrinsic part of modern society. Almost anyone has at least enough arcane talents to brush a psychic body of nearby sapiens, and it is a fact considered by many to be rude to not do that, as it adds truthfulness and trust to the conversation. It is something often done automatically, and something that me and my colleagues had to consciously refrain from doing with the humans. The most basic arcane talent test involved an arcanist to connect their mind to the subject, to verify the presence of the connection that would be necessary for even the lowest form of arcane manipulation, the brushing that I was talking about earlier. The result of the first test was completely unexpected. The humans had a yes, a connection to the arcane, but no arcane energy seemed to flow. Their mind space was completely devoid of arcane energy, but there was a strange secondary connection that seemed to go everywhere and nowhere at the same time that made us pause. The procedure for the situation was to test the reaction to an influx of arcane energy, but the secondary connection made us wary. Was it the true reason behind the absolute absence of arcane energy in the humans? Was it something related to their bodies? 
The hesitation must have been more than clear, because the subjects began to grow agitated with our conferring over the results. Doc, is everything all right? Uh, these dudes didn't give me an instant brain cancer or something, right? Mike, the current subject, said, looking worriedly to the huddle of nerds to the side of him, conferring over a screen. What? Oh no, don't worry, humans. Arcane energy does not affect sapient minds and bodies. They are protected by the very connection that allows the arcane to be channeled. We were merely puzzled by your species' apparent lack of ability to utilize arcane even in the presence of such a sturdy-looking connection. I responded quickly, batting down the coat that was ruffled in a group huddle that followed the strange observation. In fact, it seems like you have a second connection, though we don't have the faintest idea where. I continued, quite embarrassed at this point for our evident lack of conclusion. <sighs> muttered Mike. I guess even alien scientists don't have all the answers. The preparation for the arcane contact test was minimal, requiring only the arcanist and the subject to hold hands, and for the arcanist a bit of concentration. The result was so outside of the expectations that it took us a good three hours to understand what happened, and a couple more to come to terms with it. You see, humans apparently are a peculiar type of hive mind. They have a single psychic body shared with every human alive, and independent mind spaces kind of like a billion-headed hydra. The terrifying result of this is an almost omnipotent being, deprived of one thing it needed to exert its influence on our reality by its birth that drained the entire sector of arcane energy to form itself from the psychic bodies of the then barely sentient humans. This isolation from the arcane allowed the humans to live quietly up until now. But this contact that was made then unlocked something inside of them as the sector is now incredibly dense in Arcade, second only to the sector in Sagittarian A. It has been three local days now, at the humans. When we arrived, they were on the cusp of interplanetary colonization. Now, it's a three-kilometer-thick ring around Terra, and they apparently merged more with their psychic body, achieving a state of near-species-wide comprehension. I'm sure now that we've fecked up. End of story. Story number two. Living Furnace, written by Ozzy Endeavor. My name is Adric Ogon. I have been assigned to a mission to explore a planet on the verge of the known galaxy. The planet's nickname is Frozen Heart, as the whole planet is apparently a frozen waste so ungodly cold that no intelligent life could ever have a chance to survive. Yet, uh, for some reason, the higher-ups seem to think that it is worth analyzing. My partner on this mission is a reptilian alien named Galanto. He reminds me of a large frilled neck lizard from back on Earth, though he is still only half my size. We only met when we were being put onto the shuttle that would take us to the planet and return us to the main ship. By right now, we sit in silence. Galanta double and triple checking he has everything he needs, even though several others already did just that before we left. We both have a lot of equipment. I'm carrying basically everything that'll allow us to do research, while he seems to be carrying a lot of things required for survival. Or rather, his survival. I barely recognize any of the devices or gadgets that he's spreading over so I just assume his species is more fragile than humanity. We are still relatively new to the Galactic stage. I wouldn't be surprised if there were many things our species still didn't know about each other. When the shuttle finally reaches the planet's surface, we put on the suits that'll help us preserve against the harsh climate until we are able to set up a base with what is in the shuttle's storage. As I finally step foot onto the frigid plains, I look upwards and see a thick cloud obscuring the entire sky. So, that is it, the frozen heart. He walks onto the snow with his snugly covered tail, leaving a long streak behind him. Yeah, we should try and set up base as soon as we can. I look back for a response, only to see him gawking at the ground. Um, hello, are you okay? Oh. Why, oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, I'm fine, S sorry, uh, it's just, uh, I, I never thought that I'd get to all of this. Sure, it's beautiful, but it just looks like winter back home. 
Honestly, it was something called Frozen Heart. I expected something harsher than this. While we got everything set up, Galanta seemed to get more and more nervous with time. Just like in the shuttle, he triple-checked everything that we did. Every once in a while, he'd excused himself and went to use one of the gadgets that he brought here. It was some sort of machine that connected to his suit, apparently charging it up. Though for what, I wasn't sure. It made me notice how complex his suit was compared to mine. His looked close to an old spacesuit, while mine was basically a glorified winter jacket. What's your species called again? Four. Why do you ask? I was just wondering why your suit and stuff is so much more complicated than mine. What? He seemed confused, then seemed to focus on what I was wearing. Wait, holy crap, is your face exposed? He freaked out, running up to me and grabbing my arms before dragging me into the shuttle and closing the airlock. What the hell was that for? I ripped my arm away from his, to him looking mortified. Are you okay? Your face was exposed to the air. No crap, genius. It's been like this the whole time we've been outside. It has? Then how the hell are you not dead? I am not dead because it's just a bit cold air. Can't be much more than uh, minus five or something. I expected the planet to be colder, but here we are. He sits down and puts his snout in his hands. How the hell can this be possible? How can you say that like it's nothing? That's when it dawns me. I almost laugh at the situation. He's a reptile, after all. Thanks for being concerned, but you don't need to worry about me. Now, let's get back to setting stuff up before nightfall. With that, I walk out into the cold. Right, uh, okay. We managed to get everything up and running just before the temperature started to drop rapidly and head inside our little base. We start organizing everything. What we'll do tomorrow, what we'll collect and inspect, where we'll go, things like that. After a long day of work, I decide to go to bed early. We'll start at first light after all. Before long, I'm jolted awake by Galanta. He's freaking out again. Oh, it is. Something's wrong. Very wrong. The temperature in the base is plummeting and I don't think the heating system in the sleeping quarters is going to last much longer. Have you figured out what's wrong yet? Can we fix it? I have no idea. I was so thorough with my inspections. Calm down. We'll figure this out. Says the mister I can survive negative temperatures. Fair. But that's no reason to lose your head. If we can't figure out what's going wrong, then it's probably safest to stay the night in the shuttle. But as soon as the doors open, the heat will escape. It's our only option. We'll have to be quick. So with that, we exit the sleeping quarters and then immediately hit in the face by a blast of cold air. I get used to it, though. We need to get to the shuttle. When we're there, we open up the door and close it behind us as soon as we can. What is the temperature inside here? It's... God damn it. It's seven degrees Celsius. Is that bad for you? Of course it's bad. If I can't charge up my suit and refill my oxygen, I'll be done for. He falls to the ground, defeated. I looked around the small shuttle, trying to find anything that could help. Jackpot. A thick blanket. It was probably packed for me, but I never needed it. Before I can say anything, his suit begins to beep furiously. He starts to really freak out. No, 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 please, please don't. He begs his suit, but to no avail. Calm down and take it off before it runs out of oxygen. Where are you not listening to me? It's seven degrees Celsius. I take off my jacket and approach him with the blanket. I'm warm-blooded. My body gives off heat. You'll be okay. Just take off your suit and trust me. He hesitates, but the furious beeping only becomes worse. Okay, I trust you, Adric. He breathes once in and out before taking off the helmet. The reaction is immediate and he tenses up before he's able to do anything else. I have to help him out of his suit, almost tearing it while I wrap him and myself in the blanket. As soon as he scales, makes contact with my skin, his instincts take a hold and he tries to get as close to the warmth as he can. The small amount of time it takes for the blanket to trap enough heat is tense, as I worry it was too late. But eventually, he begins to warm up. He looks up at me with glistening eyes. Thank you. It's okay. You're gonna be just fine. You're like a living furnace. Humans are nice. He looked so helpless like this. The only thing standing between him and a frozen death is a piece of fabric myself. We stay awake all night. I need to make sure that he stays warm enough, 
so I don't dare separate from him for even a moment. I finally manage to hold on to him in a way where I can walk around while keeping him covered fully in the blanket and call for help. When we are taken back to the ship, Galanta has immediately rushed to the med bay to make sure that his cold didn't damage anything. I, on the other hand, let the higher ups know how ridiculously idiotic it is to send someone who is cold blooded to an ice planet. Their reasoning, I was the only human available, and it was a two-person job. Let's say the crew immediately requested more humans to be hired. End of story. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Ashtraya the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.